Ready? Okay, we went to the back side of the sheet in case you're trying to follow along with your sheet. I'm going to repeat a couple things. These bumps on the brain, these bumps on the brain are called gyri. The valleys here are called sulci, like there and there, called sulci. So we got gyri and sulci. You have this major sulcus right here called the central sulcus. That's the central sulcus. This is the central sulcus. Central sulcus, central sulcus. The gyrus in front of the central sulcus right here and right here is called the pre, I'm sorry, it's not lined up quite right. Right here and right here is called the precentral gyrus. The gyrus behind my central sulcus here and here is called the postcentral gyrus. So precentral gyrus because it's in front of the central sulcus. Postcentral gyrus because it's behind the central sulcus. The precentral gyrus is very important and that's the primary motor area. The postcentral gyrus, the, the precentral gyrus, I make sure I said that right. The precentral gyrus is very important because it's the primary motor area. The postcentral gyrus is very important because it's the primary somatosensory area. All right. If I open this up and I look inside, I have this right here called the cingulate gyrus. Now, it doesn't look exactly the same in all of these brain models. Let me get this tape off of here. It must have been Guga's kids. Google's folks doing that tape stuff. All right, here we go. This is called the cingulate gyrus. It's right above the corpus callosum. The cingulate gyrus is right above the corpus callosum. Cingulate gyrus. That's a limbic lobe. Then we have fissures. Well, fissures, where did fissures? Then we have um, commissures. Commissures connect the right and left hemispheres to each other. That's what the commissures connect. All right. Now, three major, well, th really one major, major commissure, one real major commissure, and that is this corpus callosum right here. This corpus callosum is a major commissure. Then I have two uh, minor commissures. One is this anterior commissure right here, and one is this posterior commissure right here. Now let me name a bunch of stuff on here because look what we're naming. We got posterior commissure, pineal gland, habenula, corpus callosum, anterior commissure, fornix, septum pellucidum, choroid plexus, interthalamic adhesion, thalamus, hypothalamus, mammillary body, pituitary, and it's all packed in this one little circular area. Not to mention fourth ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, third ventricle, and behind that septum pellucidum is a lateral ventricle. I mean, just in this one little area, you got all kinds of stuff packed right in there, and you got to learn it all, and it's all slightly different from each other. So the corpus callosum is a major commissural fiber right there, corpus callosum. The anterior commissure is another commissural fiber, and posterior commissure is another commissural fiber. The fornix, this is the fornix right here. What the fornix does is connects the hippocampus to the thalamus. Now, I haven't showed you where the hippocampus is yet, but I will. Let me show you a couple other fornix, fornices. This is a fornix. Notice that the fornix is right below my septum pellucidum. Here's a fornix, here's my septum pellucidum. Here's a fornix, here's my septum pellucidum. You're going to say to me, Kiggins, the septum pellucidum on one is tiny, the septum pellucidum on the other is big. Yeah, it is but you just have to orient yourself. Fornix, septum pellucidum. Hmm. Right. Did you show on that one again? Yep. Fornix, Fornix septum pellucidum. Okay. Show you on here. Fornix, septum pellucidum. Okay. Hippocampus is hard. Well, it's not hard. It's really not hard. I've got to put this back together for you, though. Oh, that came from, I don't want that. I want this one. It's it's really not hard, but it's hard to. It's not uh, not apparent. Remember how I said put the stick through here and you hit the insula. Mm -hmm. So I put my stick through my lateral fissure and I hit the insula. If I were to stick my finger through that lateral fissure and curl it down, 
I'd be touching the hippocampus. So what that means is this. If I were to take off my temporal lobe and I look down in the bottom of it, there's my hippocampus. That's just like sticking my finger through there and curling it down. My hippocampus is at the base of my temporal lobe right there. Right there's my hippocampus. Hippocampus does memory, spatial, spatial orientation. And it's part of the limbic system too, so emotions. That's my hippocampus right there. That fornix connects my hippocampus up here, up into my thalamus. The fornix connects my hippocampus to my thalamus. All right. Let's see what's next. Oh, we got ventricles. This is what I need. This is a model showing you ventricles. All right. Now what happens is this. These jaguar looking things are lateral ventricles. The lateral ventricles are connected to this third ventricle. The third ventricle has, on this model, which looks like a hole. It is not a hole. There is solid tissue in there. Remember, this model is a model of a hole, really. Mm -hmm. The model is a model of the ventricles, which are cavities. So this is not really a hole. It's really solid tissue, and this is cavity around that solid tissue. That, what, goes, what that solid tissue is, is this interthalamic adhesion right there. That's what runs through that. Third vent that third ventricle. So this lateral ventricle right here is connected to that third ventricle through this little space right here called the interventricular foramen. Some people call it the foramen of Monroe. So lateral ventricle, third ventricle, foramen of Monroe or interventricular foramen. This third ventricle is connected to this fourth ventricle down here through this cerebral aqueduct. That's the cerebral aqueduct right there and here's the fourth ventricle. All four ventricles make cerebral spinal fluid. All four of them. Because all four ventricles make cerebral spinal fluid, all four ventricles have choroid plexuses. Now let me show you something that's really, really cool. You probably recognize this by now. You recognize this by what comes out of here. All right? This is the brain being put back together. Let me just put it back together once for you. If I put this back together for you, now I'm going to take it apart. I take off my temporal lobes. You can see my cortex and my medulla. All right. If I take this, take this part out and I keep it together like that, if I stick this stick down in there, I'm in my third ventricle. I'm in my third ventricle. You're going to say, where are my lateral ventricles? They're up in here, and I'm going to prove that to you in a second. But let me pull this apart. I just said I was in my third ventricle in here. And I also told you that in this model, the interventricular the interthalamic adhesion runs through that hole right there. Well, here's my interthalamic adhesion. And I'm in the third ventricle, which runs right through there. All right, now let me prove to you that the, where these things exist. You need to take a brain stem like this and tuck it in here and tuck it in here and push them together a little bit. Not so much that you break anything but just kind of look at it and say, wow, that's how those ventricles exist. And if you want, you can remember that this whole thing slides up in there, right? And you can see that. And you can see where the laterals exist, where the third exists, where the fourth exists. You can see all that. You need to do that. All right, so these are my ventricles. Now, the ventricles all have choroid plexuses. So I want to put that back in there and show you something. I wanted to show you something else that I forgot to. So let me put this back in here. This is my lateral ventricle. That's my lateral ventricle's choroid plexus right there, that blue stuff. Well, obviously, because that's my lateral ventricle. This is my third ventricle's choroid plexus right there. And on this model, my fourth ventricle doesn't show a choroid plexus. It's, it would be right there. But let me show you a model that does. This is my third ventricle's choroid plexus. How do I know? Because it's my third ventricle because it's around the interthalamic adhesion. And that's a choroid plexus. Right here is the fourth ventricle's choroid plexus. Here's the fourth ventricle. Here's the cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle. Choroid plexus of fourth ventricle. You're going to say to me, I can't see my lateral ventricle's choroid plexus because I'd, I'd have to poke through that septum pellucidum. Well, I don't have to poke through the septum pellucidum. I turn it around and there's my jaguar. There it is. See how it looks like a jaguar? So this is my lateral ventricle. 
and this is my choroid plexus of my lateral ventricle. Choroid plexus of my third ventricle, choroid plexus of my fourth ventricle. Perfect. Now, we have some blood flow here. This is the inside of my skull. See the face? Face, side of the head, back of the head, tipping it towards you. So this is the forehead, this is the back of the head. Running into this skull is the circle of Willis right here. The circle of Willis is pretty important, it's an anastomosis. It ensures that if one of these major, major arteries was blocked, if I block right there, you're gonna say no blood could get over here. Well, that's not true. The blood could come up, circle around the circle of Willis this way, come over here, and still get over there. Now that doesn't help me for blocking that small artery. That could lead to a stroke still. But what it means is, I'm not gonna lose a whole hemisphere by a blockage. Blocking right there, I would not lose my whole hemisphere from a stroke. The blood would get around to that hemisphere the other way. So the circle of Willis ensures that an, an entire hemisphere of my brain doesn't get, devoid, doesn't get robbed of blood. Here's how that forms. First of all, if you recall from bio 203, these cervical vertebrae right here have holes in their transverse processes. Those holes that stick is in is called a transverse foramen. Altogether, all of these transverse foramen lined up are called transverse foramina, plural, for, plural to foramen. This vertebral artery runs through those transverse foramina. And that vertebral artery comes up and it enters my, it enters my foramen magnum right there. Now let's look in here. Here's my vertebral artery coming in. Here's the other vertebral artery coming in. These two vertebral arteries fuse. They fuse into this ba basilar or basilar artery right there. That basilar artery looks like a centipede almost because it has other little arteries coming off that look like legs. All right, now coming, these two vertebral arteries fuse into my basilar artery. And then from my basilar artery, I have this posterior communicating artery. It connects my basilar to my internal carotid. And here's my other posterior communicating artery. It connects my basilar to my internal carotid. Now, I'm gonna to prove to you that's your internal carotid right there and right there. Here's my common carotid. Here's my external carotid. And if you follow the external carotid up, you'll see that it does not enter my skull where the, where the internal does. It doesn't, it stays, it stays out here, stays out here. Right there, right there it goes through Oh, I can't see what it's going through, but it doesn't enter my skull back in here. Here's my internal carotid, and you follow it up through. My internal carotid follows up through, and right here is where it enters the skull. And if you follow that stick, that's right here. You can see how it comes in right there, all right? So that's my internal carotid artery. This posterior communicating artery connects my basilar to my internal carotid. Coming off my posterior communicating artery is this posterior cerebral artery and that posterior cerebral artery. So you're gonna say, well, then my posterior communicating connects my posterior cerebral to my internal carotid. Yes, it does. The posterior communicating connects quite a few things. Then I have my internal carotid. Coming off the internal carotid, I have my middle cerebral. Middle cerebral artery here, middle cerebral artery here. What connects my two middle cerebrals and two internal carotids together is this anterior communicating artery. The anterior communicating artery here and here connects my two internal carotids and my two middle cerebrals to each other. Right there it is, right there and there. Coming off my anterior communicating artery is this anterior cerebral and that anterior cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral and anterior cerebral. This anterior communicating artery connects my two anterior cerebrals together. So the circle of Willis is a big redundant connection for all these arteries and it's called the circle of Willis. Venous drainage. Two, first of all, the veins start to drain, not as veins, but as, can you hear me the top of that skull? But as sinuses, dural venous sinuses. And it's actually the dura mater. The dura mater has two layers. One's called the periosteal layer and one's called the meningeal layer. The dura mater separates and forms these dural venous sinuses right here. Those blue lines you see. This dural venous sinus right here. This dural venous sinus right here. This dural venous sinus right here, which is in the sagittal section, is my superior sagittal sinus. Superior sagittal sinus. This dural venous sinus right here is my transverse sinus. And to remind you of something, to remind you that this fissure 
separating the cerebellum from the rest of the brain was called the transverse fissure, was it not? It was. Well, if I put my cerebellum in there, you can see that the transverse sinus is right with the transverse fissure because the transverse fissure is separating the cerebellum from the rest of the brain. It's not in there right now. And which is in there right now. And that's it. All right. If you guys could get both movies